Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Louise and today we are going to watch my interview with Louis Provost, Head of Communications at Gaps Move. Gaps Move's slogan is Decoding Cultures. And so today's episode is all about culture. What does culture mean to you? The cultural challenges that you might face as an international lawyer or a legal professional and what tools you can use to become more culturally aware. I'm also going to share with you an access code to give you a free trial of Gaps Move, and you can find that in the show notes if you're listening to the podcast or in the description below if you're watching on YouTube. I also want to mention that if you are indeed listening to the podcast, go to studylegalenglish.com forward slash episode 127 and you can find the transcript of this interview there as well if you're watching on YouTube just click on the captions button and you're going to be able to get subtitles for this interview. I do recommend that you watch this on YouTube over on the Study Legal English YouTube channel because Louis shares his screen in this interview and I think you're going to want to see it. Of course, if you like this interview, do subscribe to the Study Legal English podcast and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Okay, let's get started. So, hi Louis, how are you? Hi Louise, thanks for having me on board. Uh, thanks a lot. Good. I'm doing well, doing fantastic. Excellent, excellent. Well done, welcome. And uh, so, and we're basically doing this interview because we met in May. We met at a conference, uh, employability for graduates in, in Brussels. And Louis and his colleague, Thibault Eason Du, um, did this uh, presentation that I was really impressed with. I was like, wow, this is super interesting. I think listeners, you are going to be very interested in this because international lawyers dealing with different cultures, cultures like a big element of, of communication. So, yeah, we're finally doing the interview, so that's good. So I'll stop talking and I'll start asking some questions. Um, so, Louis, first question. What is culture and what is, what's Gaps Move? What's the Gaps Move cultural decoder? All right. So uh, that was a very interesting first question because uh, most people actually only get to see the top of the iceberg. So that's also called the culture, as it is called the culture with a big C. It's a culture you can see, that you can feel, listen in, in what, when you're having an interview, when you're walking down the street, when you are also interacting with your clients as, as a lawyer, you know that. And um, that's the big C. And there is also the cult, another model of culture that's called the cult culture with a small C in, uh, in the position to the big C. Both are obviously linked between each other, but the culture with a small c is the uh, whole set of values, for example, shared belief that, well, shared belief because they are shared among a specific community, be it a community of a national, for example, French people, English people, or also a what's called a sub-community, for example, um, HR people community or lawyers community also community and, and the subculture per se. Uh, so that's basically what culture is, an, mm. an entanglement of what you can see, the big C, and what you cannot see, the, sh the, the this value set, for example, that you cannot see, but that is usually the most important thing in culture. And because you can't see, that's the reason why you need to um, investigate a bit more on, on this. Have you actually... Have sorry. you got, uh, sorry to interrupt you, have you got an example of like, you know, a, a concrete example of like the big C and the small C? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, well, for example, um, you probably remember when you were kids, uh, some kids would have like extra classes in the evening, for example, to improve themselves, math, grammar, whatever. In some countries, um, for example, in Greece, where I have my step, my family-in-law, sorry, in Greece, uh, most kids would tend to um, resort to these, uh, it's called evening classes or afternoon classes, actually, so extra classes, not because they want to be the best, but because uh, they want to make sure that they will not fail. So they, as opposed to um, countries like uh, South Korea or Japan, 
where kids do not take extra lessons because they don't want to fail. It's because there is this culture of perfectionism where you want to be the best. So in these cases, the, in these both countries, you have the same big C taking mm -hmm. extra classes, extra yeah. lessons, but the small C is different. On the one hand, you have a culture of perfectionism. Everything has to be perfect and you have to be the best to stand out from the crowd. And on the other side, in Greece, it's more a culture of how can I be content with this and mm -hmm. how can I make sure that I will not fail? So that's one example among others on how big C can sometimes be the same and the small C, the set of values, is radically different. Mm, yeah. I'm trying to think of like British people, like would, would a big C, for example, be, um, you know, oh, British people are polite, like, you know, a sort of, I know that it's a stereotype, but it's also quite, you know, speaking as a, as a British person. Yeah. Um, that we do tend to, you know, say say sorry a lot or tend to be concerned with politeness. Would that be a big C? Well, I love your question, Louise, because the fact politeness, there is literally no kid on this planet that has been raised with something like, don't be polite. It's, yeah. it's useful. It's something we all get from our parents, regardless of whether you're from the UK, from Japan, from South Africa, from Mexico, always the same. What changes is, as you may have guessed, the big C. Yeah. The concept of politeness is small c in the sense that it's, it's a set of value. But how to be polite? It sounds like a stupid question, but how can you be polite? Yeah. Eating with your hands? Slurping? Is slurping your pasta polite? Obviously not for you and us, for yeah. you and me, sorry. But in other countries, slurping your pasta is a sign of politeness because yeah. you show respect to the chef. Never slurped your pasta in Italy. It's not going to work like that. <laughs> well, I have to say I have difficulty, you know, doing the spaghetti. Ah. <laughs> Sometimes I can't help it. But okay. All right. So, um, and yeah, so when, because I, I looked at like, you know, a definition of culture, I think a lot of people listening to the show, they automatically will grasp the concept of culture, especially for, I think a lot of the, the listeners, you know, they are practicing law in their own jurisdictions. So of course they're, they're in their own countries. However, they're dealing with other cultures in, um, in meetings with clients, with other lawyers, maybe some listeners have studied abroad. So they've experienced a different kind of culture and, um, you know, maybe even culture shock and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, thank you for your, for your definition of culture and sort of giving us, us an insight into that. So let's move to Gap Smooth. So I know what Gap Smooth is. It's brilliant, but the listeners don't. So can you explain what is Gap Smooth? Sure. So Gap Smooth is a digital platform that was created uh, two years ago, brand new company uh, in France. And the reason why we came up with Gapsum is the following. So my colleagues, Thibault and Virginie, who are actually the founders of, of Gapsum, worked years and years in the language, language learning industry. So selling language course to professionals, lawyers, engineers, HR people all across the world. And obviously you cannot, you cannot remove cultural science from, from learning a language. When you learn a language, you learn a culture as well. And um, so Gapsu was given, I mean, they gave birth to Gathru in the with the motivation that you can train people specifically on, uh, on cross-cultural science, but not using the kind of old-fashioned cross-cultural training that took more or less, less like a one-day workshop where you get to speak with someone who is a cross-cultural expert. No, Gaps Move were on the opposite side and said, okay, well, we'll indulge into the efficiency of short video learning. And that's what the Gaps Move, the Gaps Move platform is about. Um, so it's basically an online platform made to help you learn, you, your team, uh, regardless of what kind of company you work with, to help you learn cross-cultural science and how, and concretely speaking, it helps you better deal with uh, clients, with uh, with your team also, um, I suggest I can just show a few a few examples. Yes, yeah. So 
I've seen um, I've seen uh, Louis and Thibault did a demonstration of the Gapsmooth platform at the conference in in Brussels, and um, uh, so it's very snazzy, very modern. Listeners, if you don't know what snazzy is, it's sort of like ooh, very fun. I don't know if I have to define. I don't even know the word myself. Fun, uh, you know, modern, colourful, and um, yeah, it's really. It seems like a really motivating um, way to learn about culture, really, rather than just sort of reading a textbook. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and share your sure. screen. That's fine. And so, listeners, if you're if you're listening, again, I urge you to watch the video because now Louis is sharing his screen, and you can really see what snazzy means now with all of these <laughs> bright colours. So, Louis, take so us through this. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for your kind of words, by the way. So Gapsmove is, as a total platform, made out of uh, actually a lot of video learning, um, a lot of videos that you are, that are here to help you learn. So you end up on here on the Gapsmove app. And the platform is made out of four blocks that you see in the top. Explore, compare, practice, evaluate. Explore is here for you to um, as you can imagine, explore a specific skill in a specific yeah. country. For example, let's say that as a lawyer, you want to learn how to uh, negotiate mm -hmm. with your clients who are from France. Mm. So you can choose in this way between um, several skills from negotiate, give a presentation, lead a team, socialize, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say you want to negotiate with the French. So you choose negotiate France and you click on go. Okay. This will lead you to one video. Oh, sorry about that. So one video, uh, we're always talking about very short video capsule, a maximum of three or four minutes, something that you can do very easily. Mm, very bite-sized Exactly, bite-sized video so that you do one video, on, uh, get to know, get to better understand the key gaps between, um, in, I mean, in this specific case and the quiz at the end, because without quiz, the learning journey is not complete. So basically, you would watch the video, go to the key gaps, to explain to you what kind of cultural differences you will be confronted with, and the quiz at the end. Can I just ask a question here, Louis? So of course. basically, so you've said, I want to negotiate with France. Presumably, like at the beginning, when you're when you set up your profile on on Gapsmove, you input your nationality. Is that correct? It's even better than that. Thanks for asking, because yeah. probably some viewers might wonder, okay, why is this um, small uh, sh sh this picture like this? Well, uh, on the moment you register on Gapsmove, you have to complete a personality test, a cultural personality test. Sorry to make sure that um, you have a profile on the platform and so that you can also compare yourself, not just your nationality, but yourself with another culture. Yeah. We are all different, uh, even someone from the same country, obviously even from the same family, sometimes we have very different characteristics. And that's the reason why Gapsmo wants to make sure that you can take the best from cross-cultural science and better get to know how, how is it to deal with people from China, France, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But taking also into consideration your own personality because not everything um, is based on your cultural nationality, as you can imagine. So that's yeah. the first thing you do. You take a cross-cultural text, um, which takes you something in the lines of 10 or 15 minutes. All right. So here in this image that you're showing, is this... French and French, or is this a different nationality well, with French? Look how interesting it is. Here in this case, that's me. If you have a look at explicit, for example, on the left side, that's me, uh, that yellow um, human shaped figure. That's me. So you being on the a French right, person. Exactly. But that's just me, me, Louis, no one else. And on the right, you have the French flag. Okay. And that's exactly what I wanted to highlight before is that. Using this, uh, I mean, having watched this video now, I can better understand that I am not like the typical French to the explicit versus implicit regards. Most mm -hmm. French people tend to express themselves implicitly, mm -hmm. uh, which can be troublesome for explicit people, like it is the case in Northern Europe, for example. 
But me, for some reason, maybe because I've lived a while in Germany, I tend to be rather on the explicit, maybe too explicit, as my mother would say. Um, I am on the explicit side. So that kind of gap shows you how sometimes you can be very different from, let's say, the uh, general trends in your country. Oh, that's interesting. Because so from what I understand, you know, in terms of like behaviors within a culture, there's sort of like a scale of, for example, um, uh, you mentioned that, oh, you might be more explicit because, because you've spent some time in Germany. So within Germany, like, you know, German, some German people, uh, may be quite explicit and then very explicit in their communication. But then when we compare that to, say, French people, um, it's all sort of relative, isn't it? So then, you know, French people generally would be quite implicit in their communication. But as we can see, there are some French people like yourself who are a bit more explicit on their communication. So but then when you put them together, it would be sort of generally like one being a bit more explicit than the other. Exactly. Is that As right? Said, we, are t- we, we are talking about uh, general trends that have been confirmed by decades and decades of study. Mm. Yet, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning of the video, unfortunately, not all British people are as polite as you are. Uh, they are <laughs> obviously also very uh, rude British people. And the point of also these gap system is not just to highlight whether are French people rather implicit or not, because you can always be confronted with a few exceptions. But the point of gaps move is also to teach you what are not just what are the gaps between the French and the Chinese, for example, but also how to deal with it and how sometimes gaps can be very complementary mm. or sometimes how they can be very toxic. For example, two implicit people together, we mm-hmm. cover that later, but two implicit people discussing together, that might be rather toxic mm. in comparison with, uh, let's say, one implicit and one explicit person. Uh, and in this case, maybe that would be more um, uh, beneficial than, than toxic. That's the mm. point of the, of the gap school. It's not just um, um, a list of cross-cultural difference, but it's a real... Um, guide on how to to better be a better person and how to behave in a uh, cross cultural environment. Interesting. Let me just clarify something for the listeners in case they're a bit confused as to what implicit and explicit means. So, listeners, you probably um, you might have even come across these words in your in your legal uh, you know legal language because. If something's explicit, it's expressly stated. It's stated in a direct manner. Whereas when something's implicit, it's um, we we have to infer. It's less direct communication. We have to read more between the lines and um, and try to get the meaning from it. Is that would that be how you define it, Louis? Exactly. Uh, for example, and and it has everything to do with formulation. So how do you express it, but also where do you express it? Is it like oral? Is it on paper? Um, is it digital? Is it non-digital? All of that, I, I guess, have a great impact, uh, especially in, in, in law. Yeah. Um, it it's also have a lot, has a lot to do with, uh, with grammar in the end. Um, yes, I suppose if you were using, well... Certainly, we'd say, like, if you're using the active voice, you're going to be, you will be being more explicit and more direct in your communication. And yes, so for example, you know, uh, the lawyer drafted, the lawyer drafts the contract would be a very direct, explicit way of saying something. Whereas if you said the contract was drafted in the passive voice, we'd have to then infer Oh well, who drafted the contract? Probably the lawyer. So it would be more less direct, more implicit. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. Or think of a um, of a sentence like, um, "Okay, I'll I'll consider your offer with my team." Mm-hmm. Me as 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 an explicit person, I see it as okay. There is a chance, but very implicit people will automatically understand the sentence as a no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so can we? So this is sort of the key gaps where you can get an overview. And um, 
see the gaps between, you know, you and the person that you would be negotiating with or doing your key skill with, then what happens when you go to quiz? So when you click on quiz, you will be confronted with five questions just to check whether you've learned what uh, the video content. So okay. you click on start and you basically have a uh, multiple choice question to fill in. Yeah. Nice. All right. Okay. So that's the sort of like exploring area where you, where you learn really, where you learn about your culture and another, and, uh, and the, your counterparty's uh, culture. If you're, you know, I'm saying counterparty because we're dealing with the skill of negotiating, mm -hmm. but the person with whom you are doing whatever skill it is that you're doing. Um, Okay, so what happens in the other areas, like compare, practice, evaluate? Right, so the second most important one after explore is compare. Compare is here to help you compare either yourself or one country with another one. And this is where you, we also, I guess for your audience, it's useful, better get to understand what are these cultural gaps, because even for native speakers, uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's always obvious. So let's say I want to compare, well, not myself, but let's say I want to compare, for example, the United Kingdom mm -hmm. with Japan. So, mm -hmm. okay. so we, we have a large vari variety of countries in this, so I need to find it. Okay. Yes, many countries. Yeah, and also we try sometimes to, if it's possible, if it makes sense, to include regional variation, like, for example, Quebec and is separated from Canada, um, as well as you will see um, Flanders and Wallonie in Belgium, mm. instead of having just one country, because they are, culturally speaking, uh, quite different. Okay, so let's compare United Kingdom and Japan. And here, as I told you, you will end up with first a cultural match indicator. So how much do our cultures match in general? Here in this case, it's pretty high, 70%, it's not too bad. It is not to be understood as everything will be easy, obviously. It's not that, that simple. Yeah. Um, so, and this is where you get to know these gaps. These gaps are encapsulated, if I may uh, call it like this, in a uh, pink box. Each box represents one specific skill, interacting with people. Okay. Discussing with them, negotiating, deciding, coordinating, and motivating. As far as lawyers um, are concerned, I think that the big gap negotiate is interesting because, okay. but we could also think of discussing. That is also relevant for, for lawyers, obviously. Um, and the, the two other ones, like motivating and coordinating, will be probably more relevant for managers, for example. Oh, right. Okay. So can it, so scroll up to the top. So it says the first one is interacting. So yes. what I understand is like, oh, you know, this is related to how you interact, how you do small talk. Could it be? Let's take the very, the fantastic example of small talk, for example. Okay. Small talk is definitely part from um, small C. Uh, it's not big C. It's not something that uh, I mean. It's not something that is obvious for everyone. It's a representation. It's a manifestation of culture, but we do it for different reasons. Uh, let's think about small talk. What is the point of small talk, uh, Louise? According to you, I mean, I, I think that the British love small talk. I guess. Yeah, uh, we love maybe. talking about the weather. <laughs> um, yeah, it's to break the ice. It's to make you feel more comfortable with the with the other with the person. Who you're mm -hmm. talking with. But do you think that would have any kind of impact on the transaction or on the business that is being done? Well, I would say it depends on your culture because probably in certain cultures, um, relationships are very important with getting deals done. So building trust through uh you build trust through getting to know someone and you can do that through small talk rather than a country that values more, you know, merit and, and, uh, you know, what your, your work profile. And so 
getting down to business, small talk might not be quite so important in, in if we're talking about negotiations and getting a deal done. Is that the right answer, teacher Louis? <laughs> it is, it is. It is. You pointed out the fact that some countries will value you small talk in the sense that it's just a good way to getting to know your partner, especially when sometimes in specific industries, you need to know personally a little bit your partner. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you do, um, yet sometimes it's, it's just a nice to have, let's say, because countries like the UK, as you can see on the gap, that tend to veer towards the transactional um, end of, of that gap. In these countries, if there is no, um, I mean, without a, um, a small talk, this is not going to impact the transaction by es in essence, in the sense that the transaction will be conducted regarding of whether a small talk is conducted or not. It's a shame if there is no small talk because we're used to that. And as you said, it allows us to break the ice. But in this case, the gaps move, um, uh, the gaps move model shows us how important yet not so much um, small talk is in, in the UK culture. It might be surprising. Oh no, of course, in the UK, we all, we think that, that small talk is important. Yes, it is, but it has no impact on the transaction. Mm. Okay. In the other countries, on the opposites, the small talk is not here just to be, just to be nice. It's part of the deal. If you don't do that, no deal will be conducted. It's the case in countries where it takes time to get to know your partners before you can reach an agreement, which might be frustrating to us because we want to get to the point, uh, generally in, in Europe, but there are countries in which you need time to get to the point. You just can't reach it in, in, in a few minutes. Mm. So that's more the case in Japan, which is rather veering on the um, left side of the scale. So within Interact, you know, we've got these scales of proximity and distance. Um, are there explanations of what these mean on the side? Like, or do we just, or are they supposed to be obvious to us? No, no. Well, some of them are easier to understand without explanation, but they always come with an explanation. Okay. The explanation, you can't see it on the screen, is because you have to click on it. Uh -huh. And then to get redirected okay. again to a video. Ah, because we great. didn't want to have too much text uh, there, as you can imagine. So you click on it, and again, you will end up on a video that you can watch. And then with a business case at the end, basically it's a, an open question. Um, here in this case, you see a Japanese contact for your long abscess, and as you appreciate him, you give him a hug. Appropriate gesture, yes or no? What do you think? Okay, well, I would say that if looking at the scale, considering that Je the, the Japanese flag is very on the distant side, mm -hmm. and even the British one is not very, is also quite on the distance, you know, end of the scale, the hug would probably be inappropriate. I agree. Let's it would probably be quite awkward for both the British person and the Japanese person. Mm -hmm. If we did, if we're talking about, you know, we're talking about professional situation here, right? I'm sure if, well. Oh, well, in, in, in private situation, I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've once by mistake, uh, give the, uh, you know, the, the kiss la bise that we do on the cheeks. Because I've, I've done it once mistakenly to a Japanese woman who I thought okay. were French, but of Asian essence. And it was, I mean, the least we could say it, that it wasn't a good idea. It was awkward. It was inappropriate, Louis. It was inappropriate and I was terribly sorry. About yes, it. I do have to say that as a British person, I'm very awkward in, um, you know, in um, displays of like, if somebody touches me, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, I feel a bit awkward in that situation. Um, whereas but, when I lived in Brazil, you know, people are very touchy feely and, uh, well, much more so than the British. And um, so that was a culture shock for me. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, as, as you pointed out, the, this gap, for example, is not too hard to understand proximity versus distance. Not to be, I mean, don't be fooled by the concept of proximity because sometimes proximity can be shown in a different way. Yeah. You can show your proximity to your partners without having to touch them. But in this case, we are talking about um, physical 
distance or proximity. Okay. So each of these gaps comes with an explanation because some of them, like for example, um, improvisation, no, this one is easy, but opportunism versus legalism might need explanation in this case, uh, but yeah. they always come with a video explanation. Okay, that's great. All right then. So, okay, so that's a kind of a good overview. So here you can kind of, from my understanding, you, you know, you input a culture and another culture and you get to compare them on these, you know, various different aspects of where you could have similarities and differences. You can see where you are on the scale. You can then click on it and you get these videos and explanations and sort of exactly. prompt and questions. It, and I just wanted to highlight the last thing is that yeah. you get to see the differences, um, but just because there is a gap doesn't mean, as I said before, it's a good sign or it's a bad sign. Okay. And to be really careful of that. And that's also what Gapsoft is about, is about showing you that, for example, to implicit people, like it tends mm. to be the case in Japan and in the UK, tends can be toxic. And then again, you click on it and you get to understand why. In this and case, the mismatch on this gap is a source of significant misunderstandings. Um, and sometimes on the opposite, um, closeness can be can be beneficial. So it's it's important just to to remind us that. Cross-cultural science is not just about finding differences that will ultimately negatively impact the business. No, thank God, no. Sometimes cross-cultural science is about finding differences that will positively impact the business. And I think it's also the essence of cross-cultural science. Okay. And sometimes also uh, um, similarities can impact negatively impact the business. Imagine a situation in which um, two business partners uh, express their feelings and express their opinions very explicitly. So they were pretty straightforward. You can make sure that although the discussion might be loud and etc., at least they will understand themselves. Mm -hmm. In the opposite situation where nobody wants to be impolite, as we mentioned earlier, and everyone wants to be very respectful to say to, to, towards the other and say sorry a billion times, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you may have issues. Do you know what yeah, I'm talking about? Yeah, I understand what you mean now. Yes. There's no general rule, of course, but it can be a risk. Yes, exactly. Because the the true meaning of what's being said uh, will never like, be clear, clearly exactly. expressed. Yeah. Well, exactly. if you opt for conflict versus partnership, well, if both, or for in this case, if it's the case here with Japan and the UK, if both are on the same in the same place in the scale, well, that's positive in the sense that both agree on the fact that we are kind of in between some kind of a open, ready to, to engage in some kind of overall conflict, you know, physical, of course, and obviously also trying to seek a partnership. Mm. So the conflict in the partnership, is that related to negotiation styles, like whether you're more yes. of a, a competitive negotiator or a collaborative negotiator? Exactly. In, in this case, you would either have basically on the one end someone who is always trying to find a way to, well, to create a partnership and would tend to to avoid any kind of conflict. And on the other on the other side, you have those who are totally fine with openly disagreeing and confronting with the conflictual situations. Okay. Well, there are 16 of these gaps, so there is obviously no need to learn them by heart. Yes. But it's, it's useful for a specific situation to have a look at those that are really interesting uh, and relevant for, for you. Because, I mean, you're not, I mean, I guess your, your audience, if you are to, to, to use gaps move at, at some point, you want to, to, to focus on the gaps that are specifically useful for the situation you're confronted with professionally. Exactly. Speak. Yeah. I'd imagine like, you know, with the, with the students that I teach or with listeners, you know, for example, if they've got, if they've got a client meeting, you know, they would go and like, they would have a look here at the, you know, um, maybe like maybe, oh, yeah. maybe they'd have a look at the interacting part mm -hmm. or if they've got a negotiation coming up they'd look like do a deeper dive into the negotiation okay. um so why don't we let's just have a little look at these ones the other things at the top like the practice and evaluate and then let's come back to the compare things i think this is the you know seems to be where the where the meaty 
uh, part is of GAPS Move. So what happens in practice and evaluate? All right. So um, GAPS Move offers a um, solution where you can learn at your own pace, basically. So that's what we covered with Explore and Compare. Um, yet we also offer uh, live sessions with consultants. Um, so let's say you want to book for you and your colleagues um, a workshop on, for example, let's say the basics, basics of intercultularity, inter sorry, at work in English. You up for this one and you will find out the uh, next sessions of your choice that you can book. So that's what the practice is about. The reason why we also came up with this is because uh, you have to mix the best of the two worlds. So live, real live sessions with practice with an expert and also your own learning, uh, learning at your own pace. So that's the reason why there is this practice block. Can I ask you a question about this, um, sure. the practice part? Because um, here, I mean, it sounds like there's huge scope to do like workshops, practicing, like, you know, role plays and things like that. How do you, because a lot of my listeners are, you know, international lawyers, a lot of them are also legal English teachers. So, um, or some of them might be interested in, you know, potentially being in these sort of live trainings. Is there any, are, are you recruiting people? Yes, we are, um, that for sure. Um, but um, are you actually also asking about how to take part in these classes? Both, both, both. Mm -hmm, both. So when it comes to applying as a consultant, you can, I mean, email me directly. Uh, I'll put my email, I guess, at the, uh, or the email of my colleagues, rather, at the, at the, at the interview. And uh, when it comes to taking part, well, you just have to create an account and you can register to, to, to these classes. Uh, they are part of, um, I mean, of the general membership. So uh, when you create an account on Gapsmove, I mean, it costs money, obviously, because this is where we also based our, our revenue. And, uh, but once you've I mean, paid for the package, you paid for everything. So that means that the practice will be at uh, no extra fees, obviously. But are these, so are these programs taught online? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. For example, let's say you choose, I don't know, like okay, generally the 20th, right. 20th, you can just book the class and you will have, uh, well, a session with uh, me, for example, or one of the other consultants at Scaffold. Okay, great. Very nice. Because, Quite often, at least with my students, you know, they want to practice um, specific uh, elements like negotiations, like meetings, like mediations, things like that. And uh, so hopefully listeners will be interested in that. Okay. And so the evaluate part. Well, the evaluate part is a um, skills test that you take. Uh, for example, you can decide either... I want to be tested on any kind of skills in a specific country. Uh, let's say you are in the future to work a lot with um, lawyers from, uh, I don't know, India, for example. So you can choose mm -hmm. either I want to be tested on every single skill that exists on India. So to test your level of knowledge on a specific country, or you can decide to um, test your knowledge in a specific area of skills, let's say negotiate, mm -hmm. that would encompass uh, a large array of countries that we have on on yeah, so, so that's how it looks like. Very nice. All right. Okay. So um, let's go back to the compare thing because I wanted to look specifically. I think it will be interesting for listeners to do a bit more of a deep dive in that. So because you know we we were looking at negotiation, and I think a lot of listeners do do negotiations um, and, and cross cultural negotiations. So if we imagine a scenario, you know, I'm I'm negotiating with with someone from a different uh, nationality, from a different culture. Um, which ones shall we choose? Before we were looking at the UK and Japan. Um, should we look at that one again, or should we look at it No, let, let's, let's go for another one for, for your audience. It's maybe more entertaining to mm -hmm. choose. I know, let's say Brazil, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, the United States. Great. There's a lot of Brazilian listeners. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Good. Fantastic. Okay, so Brazil and the USA. So 
listeners, imagine you're Brazilian. Some of you don't have to imagine, of course. Um, and you've got a negotiation coming up with an American lawyer. And mm -hmm. so you're a bit nervous. You're not really sure. You're probably nervous about the language, but then also you're probably thinking about the cultural elements like, oh, what should I do? So this can help you to sort of see where you're close, where you're far apart, where that closeness is, is a problem, where it's a good thing, where, where the differences, where the gaps are an issue and where they're not. So Louis, let's have a little look at this. So the first thing you will see probably is that 34% on the left. Um, don't be tricked by this one because that's definitely a quite low cultural match indicator. Yet it doesn't mean that everything will be too complicated and that uh, the chances of success are, are low. Obviously not. Okay. Um, it's just here to show you that they are cultural differences stemming from history, religion, geography, etc. that must be uh, taken into consideration. So let's start with, uh, well, the, the first, first one, by the way, proximity and distance, we covered it first. Uh, so what does that mean concretely? You are almost on the opposite scale. So with obviously the Brazilian uh, favoring a proximity, whereas the, in the United States, you would veer toward um, maybe a more distance approach. In this case, we're only talking about um, physical distance. What does it mean concretely? It means that greeting your uh, American business partner or business partners, if there are several, you would probably be happy with a handshake. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's not just that. It's also, we are nowadays pretty well aware of these big C differences in the sense that you can simply research on Google how to greet people in this country, this country, you get the information, right? Yet, is it so easy to refrain yourself from doing something that you've been used to doing since you were a kid? Okay. So if you are used to, for example, like gently touching your shoulder's partner to communicate a sense of, don't worry, this is fine. But by doing this, you might create embarrassment. Uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that you should maybe try to refrain yourself from doing. So that's what this cultural gap, proximity and distance tells you. Try course, not to do that. Of course, a question. So, so from the Brazilian uh, perspective, like if I was Brazilian going into a negotiation with the, with the, with the US other side, um, from the Brazilians' perspective, maybe they should sort of, you know, re refrain from being completely touchy-feely. But what about from the U.S. side? Because, exactly. of course, it goes bo both ways. Should the U.S. Uh, person sort of try to be a bit more, you know, open with their body language? Well, obviously, as you said, and it's important to point it out, that this doesn't only go in one direction. This is bidirectional. The U.S. partner should definitely at least be aware of the fact that these, uh, this body language, um, I mean, this physical contact has nothing to do with uh, menace or uh, intimate, something to intimate. Of course not. But that's just a way uh, to express yourself, to communicate, just like speaking or, or something else. So the first step is being aware of that. That's the awareness step. The second step, if you want to mimic and try to do the same, you can, but you don't have to because you don't want to lose yourself in the process. Um, again, so um, just like for the Brazilian might, by mistake, touch the shoulder of the American counterpart, say, oh, sorry, I hope you don't take it personally. This is part of my culture. On the on the other side, the American counterpart might say, "Oh well, um, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not really used to that, but that's certainly fine. I know it's part of your culture." The mm. point here is to try to create a bridge to gap, because nothing is going to be perfect forever. There is a moment where, I mean, the American one might be annoyed by so that physical contact, and the Brazilian might think that that his or her counterpart doesn't want to engage in a friendly conversation because he or she refuses body contact. I mean, yeah. it's not going to be perfect, but at least you try. 
Regarding mimicking, so like, for example, you know, if a Brazilian mm-hmm. suddenly tried to like not be touchy feely, um, and the US person tried to suddenly be quite, you know, forward, you mentioned, oh, but be careful because you might lose yourself. Is yes. there a danger on some of these? You know, if you're trying to do something that you're not used to, that it could actually create more problems than simply just doing what you normally do. Mm-hmm. Well, it's all a matter of balance because mm. mimicking, you can easily end up in a very stupid and ridiculous game where you just pretend that you are Brazilian or you would just pretend that you're American while you're not. Um, you have to identify sometimes, I mean, specific elements of your meeting that you think these one, I might want to change them because this can cause issues. Okay, so, you know, be be a bit careful mimicking. Um, mm-hmm. There's something that I've heard about and, and read about called upgraders and downgraders, oh, yes. uh, which I think will be interesting for listeners to hear about. Um, can you explain a little bit about those? Yes, I'm, I'm sure it's really helpful to elaborate on this because they exist in any language, at least in a lot of language that I know. So an upgrader and a downgrader, what it is? Let's say I strongly disagree with you is pretty straightforward. We will agree on this. But if you say I might show a bit of disagreement with you, I I don't know if it sounds correct in English, but at least you can hear that maybe I do mean that I disagree with you, but I'm using downgraders like might or may uh, or words or adverbs and adjectives like a bit or slightly, these are downgraders that will allow allow you to decrease the level of straightforwardness in your in your in your discourse. Mm -hmm. Why are we talking about this, dear viewers? Well have a look at the uh, cultural gaps in front of you. In control, emotional, implicit, explicit. We, in both cases, we are all in Brazil and the US are almost opposites. Mm-hmm. So what does it mean? It means that the Brazilian will tend to express themselves without downgraders, pretty using emotions, but also using implicitness. Because you can also be implicit, but remain, have control. And you can also be very emotional and mm-hmm. um, very implicit, um, as is the case for the Brazilians. So um, in the case of a meeting with your Brazilian partners or with your American partners, if it's conducted in in English, um, you will think that you will keep in mind that American people tend to speak in a more explicit way, which is neither good or, or bad. There is no judgment to be done on this. But that in the way that Brazilian people might want to express themselves, they might want to avoid things like, oh, maybe we can, I can discuss this internally. Or, okay, um, I thought that this, maybe there is a small mistake that I've noted when you actually mean there is this big, big mistake and we need to talk about that. I hope it's making sense. I think, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll sort of do a recap. So to, to sort of recap for listeners, yeah, like an upgrader, they're usually... Um, like uh, I strongly disagree. Mm-hmm. This is a a, a major this is an problem. absolute nonsense. For this example. is absolute nonsense. Um, they augment the the conflict or or make the uh, a disagreement more explicit. Um, and um, downgraders and the opposite uh, might be used in a way that you for some people you do not express yourself clearly. If I say, are you sure that your argument is logic, which is literally translated from the French, this is something that we would use a lot in French, meaning that I think that what you said is a nonsense. Yes. But it's in a downgraded way. Yes. So to, to sort of downgrade the conflict, to downgrade the problem, you're sort of framing your language in a way that you're being a bit more implicit, sort of hiding the problem, like, oh, this is, oh, this could be a small problem for us. Or as you mentioned, like, are you, are you sure you want to do it in that way? And, um, 
So really, you might have two people who are saying very different things that actually mean the same of the underlying meaning. Exactly. Same. Exactly. So whenever you're talking with implicit people, you want to use a little bit more downgraders without losing yourself in the process, of course. And when speaking to explicit people, you might want to use a bit more upgraders to make sure that what you say uh, will be taken seriously. Do you think that you maybe need to be a bit careful using upgraders because they could, you know, um, if you don't use them correctly, you might mm -hmm. be considered to be a bit aggressive? You can, um, but at the same time, when you know, for example, that you're someone who is very implicit or explicit, it's important at the beginning of the discussion to clearly state, and I tend to speak in a more in implicit way, et cetera, et cetera. Or on the opposite, if you're rather explicit, you can say, okay, don't take it personally. I'm someone who's rather explicit. I just wanted to know before the discussion. That improves the level of communication in a way that you can't imagine. Because mm -hmm. even though you might, I might traumatize someone because of my explicitness, at least this person is aware that this is nothing personal. And it's just that person who is like this, and he, and he or she's trying to do the best to to change it. Mm -mm -mm. So maybe just you know um, recognizing your own style at the beginning and mentioning it could could even be a step Absolutely. towards better communication. All right, good, very good. I can see that there's like you know a huge amount of uh, information on this website and so much that we could go through, but. I'm afraid we don't have time. Um, so thank you for showing us that. It's a, a, an incredibly useful platform for, for, for listeners to check out. So I wanted to ask you, Louis, are there any other resources that you'd recommend? Like how can, how can listeners develop their cultural awareness further? Sure. Um, well, of course, no need to mention it further. The videos on the platform are extremely useful because the whole learning pedagogy of gaps movies based on video and nowadays videos all have taken so much way so much importance on the internet and this is how like the vast majority on the internet uh, learn so i could only recommend the videos but i can also recommend other things that because obviously cross-cultural science cross-cultural experience is something that doesn't come only from gaps move or from books it's also your personal experience um, so there is something they can definitely recommend, apart from being in a relationship with someone uh, who is from <laughs> another country that you will, where you're from, of course. Um, yes, don't I know it? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I live with a with a Greek uh, woman, and uh, this is a great way to uh, tackle a lot of beliefs that have been all kind of engraved into stone, as we say in, in French, and that are actually invalid in in other countries. Yeah. But apart from that, um, a concrete resource that I can mention, or actually several books that I have in mind, uh, that are in English, obviously, for, for the sake of your, 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 your viewers. Um, the first one is uh, mm -hmm. The Culture Map, Culture Map by Erin Mayer, who is an American uh, management expert who has been living in France for 20 years, I think. Um, these kind of books really be assured, rest assured that you do not have to be an expert in any way to read them, to understand them. I've seen literally people reading the culture map on the beach in Greece while getting a tan. So I guess this is something that is accessible to anyone. Mm -hmm. So there is a culture map uh, that provides you with a lot of example based on, based on Erin Maria's uh, experience. There is also another book called Global Dexterity from, um, from Andy Molinsky that will provide you with also some technical tools like charts and graphs uh, and also so for you to practice. It's there are even exercise in this book. Again, it's a very simple book accessible to newcomers, to students, by the way, also even, I guess, to teenagers at some point um, mm -hmm. and of obviously to you. And there's also another book um, that is actually that I only have in French, but that is mm -hmm. really useful. It's called Le Culturoscope. Mm -hmm. This is a very tiny book that fits in a pocket. And in this pocket-sized book, you will find 70 questions to unlock cross-cultural situation. Let's, let's give you an example, a very simple example. 
in your society or women women separated in terms of role for example jobs for women jobs for non women or the things that women can do and where and men can do these questions in these books there are 70 questions like that let's find another one um in your society do you matter more than the team than the group yeah. individualist versus collectivist these are questions that anyone can understand and that can unlock situation because they are what i call kids question kids especially very young ask a lot of question that are obvious to us but that are not obvious to them because there is a cultural gap between kids and and adults in the sense that they are shocked and amazed by everything that they see and that they learn that's the same with cross cultural knowledge you meeting a i don't know um a, an indian client might be amazed and surprised by how this person my rex and cetera well asking these simple question whose answer is obvious to for him or for her but not to you a nice way to unlock this situation you will not i mean you, you don't sound silly when you ask the kind of question you sound curious and interested and that's really what you need to bring you have to leave your ego and ask questions even if they sound stupid because you're just trying to find answers to your question so okay. i really recommend this book it fortunate it's in french but maybe there's an english translation somewhere maybe the yeah, cultural scope the culture rose scope cultural scope exactly cultural scope i guess in english mm-hmm. it's um but i i give you a few examples so that you can better understand the meaning with asking these kids question these don't call them silly question they are not silly question they are really important no i think you make a good point in terms of that some things are very obvious they seem obvious to you because that's part of your culture and culture is like your sort of second skin in a sense it's like something that you don't even notice until someone challenges it and so and probably there's a lot of listeners thinking what are these what you know, if if there's a listener with some listeners out there who haven't studied abroad that have always lived in their own culture that are always you know they 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 they're not dealing with uh with uh, a- any other nationalities or cultures um then they might be a bit confused about what we're talking about because you d- culture is something that's that's so obvious to you mm. or sorry it's so you know the way of doing things is like it seems so obvious and natural to you but until someone asks you oh it's not like that in my country exactly. um, like then you, you suddenly realize oh it's that's the cultural difference that's the culture we tend to say that cultural is like water for fish mm. a fish doesn't realize there is water just like we don't realize there is air around us mm-hmm. and if you've never really experienced like a significant experience abroad think of your first day in your first job you probably ask a lot of question that were silly that were not but that was silly to other uh, co-workers because they knew it but you were part of another culture so you ask a lot of question well just do the same yeah 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 it's good good idea all right um that's all thank you thank you very much louis that was well thanks a lot for the invite louis yes that was very very interesting so Great. So that's the end of this interview. I hope you found it useful and learned something new. If you've got any questions about this interview, get in touch with me. Send me an email to louise at studylegalenglish.com. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment in the comment section below, or you can contact Gapsmove directly. Just go to gapsmove.com, G-A-P-S-M-O-O-V.com. And in the left-hand side, there's a menu and just click on the contact us there. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching and see you next time.